Hello, everybody. My name is Ashton Eaton, and welcome to Atlet Mondio. Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Atlet Mondio podcast. Atlet Mondio is French for athletes of the world. In this podcast, I interview track and field athletes from all around the world in their native language when I speak it. My guest today is Ashton Eaton, two time Olympic champion and two time world champion in the decathlon. Ashton is the former world record holder in the decathlon, first with 9,039 points in 2012 when he broke Roman Chabelle's world record of 9,026 points, and then with 9,045 points in 2015. Ashton and I recorded this episode on January 5th, 2023. Six years after he and his wife Brianne, who's also an Olympic medalist in the Maltese but for Canada, announced their retirement from track and field. In this episode, Ashton tells us about what he does now, and of course about his greatest wins and about what he learned from an important loss. You're listening to the original interview in English, but the interview is also available dubbed in French if you understand French better than English. Enjoy! Hi, Ashton. Thanks for joining me. With all the respect due to every other athlete who's been on the podcast so far, and that includes world record holders, Olympic champions. This one's special because this is a track and field podcast, so I think a uh, two-time Olympic gold medalist in the decathlon is the perfect guest. So welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Is it true you never identified as an athlete? I wouldn't say that I never identified as an athlete. Um, I think what I meant to say... Uh, or what I mean by that is I don't identify as just an athlete. Okay. And I think that's fair because, um, well, I think I, I say that because I believe some people might think that, hey, this guy is, you know, spent basically his whole life doing this sport thing. Um, he was really good at it. So that must be what he's all about. Um, and so I say that to just kind of say, you know, that's not totally true. Mm -hmm. Let's go back in time. When was the first time you did something you thought you couldn't do? Oh, <laughs> um, I was seven years old mm, and I, I have a lot of examples, but let me give you two. Um, one was of my own accord. So I did it by myself and that was, I had watched the, um, I think the 1992 games. Uh, or 96 games, and I, I had watched the long jump, and it was um, Carl Lewis, Mike Powell, and I was young, uh, and I thought, you know what, that was so cool. Let me go outside and try to do that. And what I did was I set these two sticks on the ground, and I was going to try to do the long jump, and I and I ran from, you know, I just got like a run up, I jumped from one stick, and I tried to clear the other stick, and I kept this up for quite a few hours, and every time I would clear the second stick, I would just like keep moving it wherever I landed. And eventually towards the end of this like several hour ordeal of trying to figure out how far I could go, um, you know, I was, I was like basically not moving the stick anymore. I'd reached my limit, uh, but I kept going after it. It was, it was just something where I was like, maybe on this next one, I'll get over it. <laughs> and I had this mindset. And so right when it was like time for dinner, basically, um, my mom was like, all right, Ashton, time to come in. And I just, I took off, I ran, I jumped. Maybe I was faster. Maybe I held my, um, you know, landing more in the air. But I remember I landed like on my back, basically, because I was just trying to do anything to, to not uh, land on my feet and, and get as far as I could. Um, so that's one time I remember like, hey, you know, I thought I couldn't go any further. And I and I did. The second uh, example is a, a little bit more tangible. I was seven years old. I had just joined a martial arts class. And the reason I joined was because. I was totally obsessed with martial arts from watching movies and I wanted to be, I wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> and, um, I, th I thought, I thought in order to be a Ninja Turtle, um, I need to get my black belt. And so I joined this martial arts school and it was my very first day. And I was so bought in before I even started, I was like, I'll do whatever. And I remember before they even taught us the material and I just wanted to learn, like, show me everything else. You know, show me how to do the punches and the kicks and the defense, and I'll do it, do it all. Before I even did that, the first thing they said, um, hey, before we teach you, you need to do 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups. And I was like seven years old. And I was like, you have to be kidding me. I will never do that. Like, I'm not going to learn anything. Um, and so I just started going for it. 
and basically the first class I didn't do it. And I was like, okay, that's it. Uh, this is over. And I came back the next class, uh, which was a couple of days later. And they said, Hey, same thing before we teach you anything, you need to do this. And I was just like, Oh my God, I, I'm never going to complete this. Um, but sure enough, you know, I actually did. I mean, it took by the, it took like the whole hour of the class for me to do it, but I actually did it. And that was the first time. And actually martial arts was the thing uh, that taught me to, to try to do things that I think I might not be able to do. That was in Oregon? That was in Oregon. Yeah. A very small town called Lapine, Oregon. Okay. A lot of decathletes come from Oregon. Why is that? Is it just a coincidence or is there, is there something about Oregon? <sighs> My hypothesis is that Oregon generally has small towns mm -hmm. um, where kids grow up. I mean, the largest kind of area would be Portland, Oregon, and that's maybe like a million uh, or 1.5 million people in the whole like metro in the whole area. But outside of that, you start getting into towns that are like 100,000, and then they start going to like 20,000 and getting even smaller. Um, and so a lot of kids come from small towns. And what happens in small towns is that when somebody is interested in sports, they usually play a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And when they do play like American football, for example, they may also play offense and defense. So they're just, there's a lot of variety. And then I think there's a lot of um, experience and practice and training. And I think that lends itself to somebody either discovering the decathlon more or being very interested in um, a track and field event that has kind of multiple disciplines. Right. Did you attend the Profonting Classic growing up? You know what? Um, I did only because a high school track coach of mine was very smart. And I think he saw the potential for me to be a track and field athlete. Um, but I think he also saw that I wasn't necessarily, I didn't understand what track and field could be. Um, I just thought, you know, you did it in high school and then the gap from high school to Olympics was so far that I just didn't even make the connection. And he took me to the Prefontaine and he showed me the stadium filled with people cheering on these athletes, um, these athletes that I got to like high five that all of a sudden became real. Like the gap wasn't that far anymore. I was like, oh my gosh, they're right here. Um, they, they look big and strong and that's very far from where I am, but maybe this can happen for me. And so I did attend, uh, I think when I was, you know, maybe 13, 14. Okay. Did you know about the decathlon back then? Because I think the first time you read about the decathlon, you were eating cereal at the dining room table. <sighs> that's right. Yeah. Um, at that point when I attended the Prefontaine, um, I had heard about the decathlon that one time when I read it in the newspaper. Um, so that time, you know, I was like probably 10 or 11 years old. It was summer. School was out. I was just, I would wake up basically and go outside and play with my friends um, after I ate cereal. <laughs> and uh, I was eating cereal. I saw the front cover of the newspaper. There was all these athletes around a giant earth. Um, and in the center was Roman Severle. And the title was like, basically, who, who would we send to an intergalactic Olympic Games? Um, who would be representing Earth? And I knew all these other athletes, Ken Griffey Jr. Um, uh, I, I mean, back then, I can't remember. It was like Michael Jordan, you know, these kinds of things. And there's Roman Seberle. And I was like, who the heck is Roman Seberle? And why are we sending him? <laughs> um, and then, I, you know, I read the article and it said, hey, this guy is a decathlete. He does all these events in track and fields. Um, and he is the world's greatest athlete. And I was like, huh, interesting. And then I forgot about it until um, I was probably 17 years old when my coaches said, hey, we think you can do this event. That was to, to go to college? Yeah, so I was um, basically going to go to the military. Okay. That was my plan. And the, the reason was because I was heavily influenced by the, all those movies I watched when I was younger. And all the, you know, the fighting and wanting being a Ninja Turtle. And I think for an American, for an American growing up in the 90s, you know, we had um, the Gulf War. We had the uh, kind of like patriotic, you know, watching Top Gun and just all this stuff. And it, it's the message was like, hey, a really good thing to do, a, a really good way to like serve um, your country or your or 
or your people is to go into the military. And I was like, okay, that sounds cool. Like I want to, I want to fight for the forces of good or, or what I thought was that thing. Um, but I was also good at sport. And my mother, my mother was like very adamant about trying to go to college, uh, my grandparents. And basically it's, you know, we didn't have any money. So how to go was another question. <laughs> um, but yeah, long story short, I, I, these coaches of mine said, Ashton, we think you can go to a division one college, which is like the top tier in the United States okay. kind of. Um, and we think you can get paid to do it. We think you can get a scholarship. I was like, huh, okay, what do I have to do? And they said, well, this thing called decathlon. <laughs> um, I said, okay, sounds cool. It's decathlon. What did you, do you think they saw in you to make them think the decathlon was for you? You know, I've never really asked them directly. Uh, I've just heard the things they've said on podcasts and interviews and kind of read the things they've said. But I think it came down to maybe three things. One was I was a good kid. Um, you know, I was a good person. Two was I was extremely coachable. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was, you know, what that means is as soon as they would tell me, whatever they would tell me to do, I would very specifically do that exact thing. Um, you know, down to the very fine detail. Like if they said, turn your foot this way or um, like put your ankle up this way or turn your hip that way, I would just do it. I, I, I knew how to control my body from doing all these other sports, especially martial arts. And then the third thing was, I think they saw a lot of potential. Um, I think they got some kind of um, sense that I wasn't close to what my max was yet. Okay. But things went super fast, right? Your first yeah. Olympic trials yeah. I mean, were just one year into the sport or? Yep. My freshman year was 2007 at the University of Oregon. And I did nothing, basically. <laughs> um, my first decathlon, I scored 6,977 points. Mm -hmm. Uh And then one year, and I think I my pole vault best in that year was, um, I don't know, <laughs> 10 feet or something, like 12 feet. Uh, so like four meters maybe. And by the end of that year, I think my best was 7,123. Um, and then one year later, I was at the Olympic trials. And my sixth decathlon ever was at the Olympic trials in 2008 at University of Oregon. And um, I had just won the NCAA championships at 8,000, I think, 60-something points, 65 points. And then at the Olympic trials, I think I scored 81-something um, or maybe very close to there. I can't remember. So the the rate of improvement was was pretty steep. You went pro in 2011 and got silver in Daegu. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's right. I heard you that say right. that you, if you'd won gold in Daegu, you probably wouldn't have won gold in London. I believe that's true. Why? Um, the reason I believe that's true is because I learned extremely valuable lessons from losing in Daegu. And I don't know who your listeners are, but for context, if you don't know the sport, I was going into this world championship in 2011 as the best. Mm -hmm. I had the best score in the world. I had just um, scored like 87 um, without with like a relatively moderate effort at the U.S. Olympic trials. Um, even I surprised myself. I was like, wow, that I got 87,000 or 8,700 points doing that. Okay. So I was going into Daegu as a, my first year as a professional athlete, very confident in myself, <laughs> very much thinking I was going to, to dominate. And I didn't. And there were so many reasons why I was unprepared to do, to, to be, a professional and to win at an international level. Um, but Daegu taught me all those lessons. And the main re the main lessons were, um, one, expectations. So, I don't know, a month and a half before Daegu, I had scored 8,700 points with uh, a moderate effort. And so I expected to do the same thing or even better. Mm. So as soon as the gun went off for the 100-meter dash and I ran slower than I expected, I was like, oh, crap, I'm not winning anymore. Then I went to the long jump and I jumped, I mean, I think I jumped like seven meters 20, which was really bad. 
And I thought I was going to jump eight meters. And I was like, oh, my, cause, you know, that's my expectation. Like, I feel so good. I'm so young. I'm ready. Let's go to eight meters. And I jump 720. My expectation. And then I just mentally went totally downhill. Um, so Daegu De- taught me to um, manage those or, or really hope for the best, plan for the worst mentally. So obviously, I'm going to try to do my best. But what I'm going to prepare for is everything to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from that point on, that's what I did. The second thing Daegu taught me was you're always in the fight. You can still be in the fight because all of this bad crap happened. Like even in the pole vault, I think I jumped 460 only, but somehow I still got silver. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought I was like, after pole vault, I was ready to go home. I was like, I'm going to get 10th. Like, what's the point of this? Um, I just had a bad attitude. And so the second thing it taught me is you can still be in the fight because everybody else has their own crap going on. Yeah. Um, and I think, the third thing it taught me is a little bit similar to the first, like hope for the best, plan for the worst. It taught me how to train mentally and physically to win. Um, leading up to Daegu, I put myself at practice into the best case scenario. Hey, it's a beautiful day outside. Let's go pole vault. We got a tailwind. Hey, um, it's raining. You know, Let's not do discus today. Let's uh, go do something else. As soon as I got home and we started training for 2012, every time it was an adverse condition, uh, I would just do the my events in those conditions. Hey, we have a crosswind uh, and uh, in in the pole vault. You know, let's go do it. Yeah. Uh, the the ring is wet for the discus and the shot put. Let's go throw because I was like, this is part of that thing where what if I get into a situation that I can't that I've never practiced, like a ring being wet or um, headwinds and crosswinds in a pole vault. And basically from that day forward, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And um, those three kind of mental things, how to approach uh, what is necessary in order to improve and win. um, You know, I never lost after that. Wow. 2012 was an incredible year. Let's start with the, the Olympic trials. So that was at Hayward Field. That's right. And so you won, you broke the world record. And I have a feeling like, you, first, that was not a goal of yours to, to break the world record. And you almost did it without wanting to do it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Olympic trials was a verification for me that I am approaching this um, goal of mine, this sport, the thing that I do in life, that I'm approaching it in the right way. And the reason is because the weather was totally crap, <laughs> but I, I had like uh, really good marks, obviously, in everything, um, generally everything. And I was ready, like it was just pouring down rain, but it didn't bother me because uh, I had done that at practice. The second thing was just that mindset part. My only goal going into the Olympic trials was to get top three. Like I obviously knew that I was the best in the US at that point, and had the potential to win, but I didn't care if I did or not. I only wanted to be an Olympian. And if that meant I got third, uh, even even if I had to like crawl to the line and struggle to get third, um, I was like, I'm fine with that. And I think that mentally allowed, like just lowered my expectation of myself. I was like, yeah, to hell with it. I'll score 84 or 83, I don't care. Um, and it's so much easier to do that than trying to score right. 9,000 or 88. And so I just went into the mint competition totally relaxed and confident, I suppose, uh, that I would be able to do that. And as a result, I broke the world record. Um, And it was very surprising. I was at that point, not naive. Like I knew that my, I had the potential to do it. I just thought it would be, you know, 2015 or 2014, just a couple years down the line. I thought I had, you know, more kind of learning and improving to do. Um, so, you know, I was very surprised. So your coach told you, told you after the, the pole vault or yeah. was it before that? No, after the pole vault. Yeah. And by the way, the pole vault, we had a tailwind or excuse me, we had a headwind. <laughs> we had a headwind and it was raining and uh, I jumped a PV. <laughs> so I was like, see, I told you it worked. Um, <laughs> But yeah, after, after the pole vault, I knew I was scoring well, and I wasn't playing super close attention. Um, but Harry, my coach, in the break before the javelin, he said, hey, man, 
you know, if you throw the javelin this far, um, all you got to do is, you know, really use your hip and kind of get this, uh, get this thing flung out there. And in his eyes, I could see he was excited about me breaking a record. And uh, I knew the record for the American record it was like 87 or 88 at the time. And I was like, all right, Harry, tell me what I need to throw to break the American record. And he just looks at me and started kind of tearing up a little bit. And he goes, not the American record, Ashton, the world record. And I just got a cold chill going down my body. And I was like, I just, um, that was totally unexpected. And, you know, for a long time, it's, I, I had really admired Roman um, after learning more about the decathlon and what he had done. And I'd met him uh, in 2011 and competed against him in 2011 at uh, the Tallinn Indoor uh, Heptathlon. And he, yeah, I mean, I was just like, oh, this is a big deal. Um, so I kind of, I got pretty nervous after that. I did not throw the javelin as far as I needed to. <laughs> um, so I had to run the 1500 pretty fast. And I just remember sitting there before the 1500 thinking kind of like I did when I was in martial arts. Um, I've never done this. I've never run this fast before. And I don't know if I can do that. Uh, never trained to do that, something that fast. And so, but I had that mindset from when I was little, which was, I have two options. You can either try or not try. Um, so I, you know, I just made a determination. It's like, I'm going to try. I know what I have to do. I know the splits. Let's do it. Was the, the 9,000 point barrier something, would you, would you have been happy with 9,000 and one points or... I th well, that's a very good question. I've never been asked before. The Actually, my answer is no. And the reason it's no is because my goal, once I knew the world record was within my capability, or maybe just outside of it, my, my goal was to break it. Um, and so maybe this is just where my philosophy breaks down a little bit of not having expectations. Um, when it came down to that last race, I was like, I'm going to do what I can to do it. And so I probably would have been disappointed if I would, had not done it. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question. You won the Olympics in London, and I heard your coach said it was the easiest decathlon he'd ever coached. Do you know why he said that? <laughs> yeah. He said that because um, I was mentally, I mean, we were mentally and physically ready. And... As far as I was concerned, looking back um, in decathlon circumstances, we made no mistakes. Everything was just, everything was just good. <laughs> and I think it was after, you know, ever since the hundred, I don't, I had never lost the lead. Um, the closest anybody got was, you know, Trey Hardy around the discus. And I think he was like 99 points behind. Um and so I think for him, he had this expectation of it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a battle. Um, he had this goal of really wanting to coach an Olympic champion in decathlon. That was his whole life for that goal. And um, I think in his mind, he thought it was going to be so much harder. Just like I thought in the, uh, in the, after, after Daegu, um, I had this expectation. But, or, or like going to the Olympic trials, you know, thinking like all I want to do is get is get third. Um, I think he was just surprised by how easy it was to score or, or to or to do that because he thought it was going to be so much diff more difficult. Um, yeah, there was there's been a lot of competitions with Harry where we've had some pretty tense moments, some pretty anxious moments. Like, what are we going to do? Um, you need to throw this, you need to do that, and we just never had that in London. Cool. You won the, the World Champs in 2013 and then came 2014. And that year you thought, mm -hmm. I don't have enough with 10 events. I want to try an 11th one. And <laughs> you did the 400 hurdles. Whose idea was it? That was mine. Because you yeah, needed mine. a break think, from the decathlon? I did, yeah. I mean, I brought the idea up to Harry. And the reason I brought it up to him was because after Moscow in 2013, I was so freaking tired. Um. I mean, I remember crossing the line and being like decathlon tired, but even after that, I was like, that three years was super tense. 
and it's done now. We accomplished everything that we wanted to, but um, that was hardcore. And it instantly, you know, this must be like, as I'm getting ready to go to the media after the, after the competition, I'm thinking, if I'm going to do 15, 16, 17, and try to win all of those, I have to take a break. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm going to take 14 off from decathlon. And I remember emailing the sponsors, um, you know, Nike at the time. And I said, hey, or Harry and I were like, hey, I think this is what we're going to do. And we chose the 400 hurdles for two reasons. One was in order to prepare for that next kind of three-year chunk, um, I wanted to get, we wanted to get in really good 400 meter shape. Um, that's kind of like the basis of being a decathlete in our opinion. And two is that's the one I thought I could be competitive in. 110 hurdles was a little bit trickier. Um, we thought about pole vault, but we thought there was more of a risk for injury. Plus the travel with the poles was always a problem. <laughs> um, so the 400 hurdles was like, hey, you get to go to a track meet. Uh, you can fly to Europe. You can bring one pair of spikes um, and you'll be good. And so that's what we did. Mondo was on the show a few weeks ago and he said, well, traveling with poles is just, oof, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, I mean, for somebody like him, I'm sure he has several sets mm, you know yeah. so he doesn't have to travel um overseas too too much with them but yeah it's a pain in the ass <laughs> and how was it to be on the diamond league circuit because it's something you never got was, to experience before it was one of my most memorable honestly it was one of the best years of my life um and the reason is because maybe there was just no stress um there was i was just traveling the world I had no pressure for from a performance standpoint. Um, nobody expected anything of me, really, and I didn't necessarily expect anything uh, for myself. So, in a in a really weird way, it's like this creative period where I was just exploring, like, what can I do? And it was like I was being a kid again, uh, kind of just starting out in the decathlon, and um, you know, there was no expectation. So I just had a great time. I was, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles all over Europe. Um, and it was getting better. Like I had fun competing against all my other competitors. My practices were unbelievably short. <laughs> um, and yeah, and honestly, in my life at that time as well, I was contemplating already what I was doing in sport and like what I was going to do after. And um, I looked back at, uh, I, I, I kind of try to keep like a reading list. And in 2014, I read something like 30 books and I didn't even realize it. I was like, wow, I was just going to practice, coming home, getting physio. I had all the time in the world, you know, Brian and I, we didn't have kids obviously. And so I would just read on planes, read after practice. And um, yeah, it was, it was a really impactful year for me because a lot of the things I'm doing today are a result of things that I, read or thought about in 2014. Oh, okay. Do you think the 400 hurdles helped for the 400 later on? Because when you ran 45 even in Beijing on 400, a French journalist who was calling the race said that you'd done things to train for the 400 hurdles um, with different stride patterns that probably helped you for the 400 mm -hmm. flat. Yep. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the reason I was, I got so fast was because of the 400 hurdles and it wasn't just the training, but like your colleague said, it was, um, things that the 400 hurdles taught me. And the number one thing was, um, an interval that we used to do in training, a, a practice kind of set of running that we used to do at training was, uh, 300 meter intervals. So you'd run 300 meters, you wait a few minutes, run 300 meters and 150 meter intervals. And. What was super fascinating is when I was training for the 400 hurdles, I would do these 150 meter intervals, um, but I'd set up the first three hurdles. So that would take me, actually, sorry, no, no, I, I have this wrong. I would do 200 meter intervals, but I'd set up the first 150 meters of hurdles. So I think that's like three. And I remember Harry telling me the time of the 200 after going over three hurdles. And I was like, you're wrong. It's too fast. And he goes, Ashton, I'm telling you, it's not too fast. And I felt the same as if I had uh, barely, like just barely tried. I was like, I don't understand how I'm running these times when I don't feel like I usually do. What was happening was 
the hurdles require you to get out of your blocks extremely hard, kind of like a Karsten Warholm. <laughs> um, if you're going to, if you're, if you're going to do thir- if you're going to do 13 steps and they, they require you to maintain that all the way through the curve, all the way through a uh, hundred and then maybe even 120 meters. And so after I'd come over that third hurdle and I would finish my interval on, on the flat with no more hurdles and finish at 200, I would just kind of relax and I would run these crazy times. And so what I learned was if I could get out in the 400 meters, very similarly, I could probably run an incredibly fast, like a much faster 400. Um, and sure enough, the first 400 I did on flat ground was in Santa Barbara at uh, a very small competition called the Sam Adams multi-event. I didn't do the decathlon there. I was just doing uh, select events, but it was the first time I think I had run 45 and I ran like 45, six or four. And I was like, this works. I just acted like I was running 400 hurdles with no hurdles there. And I ran like a second faster. So, yeah. And you probably could have run uh, under 45 outside of a decathlon. I know. I know. I I mean, it's definitely possible. Um, And I I did run a lot of open 400s. Um, I did run a lot of open 400 meter races, but I never ran under 40, 45. And so there was something about Beijing, um, where I, I actually thought I was going to run 46 because I was pretty tired, but I remember watching the heats before me run like incredibly fast personal bests, um, or just fast times. And I thought, man, I'm going to get after it and just see what happens. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously I was insanely surprised. I was like, there's no way I ran 45 flat. Um, something's wrong here. I, I was like looking around because at that same competition, Veronica Campbell Brown was running the 200 and she ran from like lane six and she went into lane seven. Like she got confused. And I was like, maybe I went from like lane six to lane five and I'm like disqualified. Um, so anyway, I, 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 I kind of wish it was 44 or nine because that would be cool. But well, your PBs are pretty impressive anyway. So talking about Beijing. I love watching the the 1500. Oh. So Lobby Barada of Algeria won the race. Yes. And watching the race, I was wondering if, because it looked like he was helping you, but I was wondering if it was something he did on purpose or if he's, he was just doing his own race. Honestly, I don't know either. Um, he was never super good at English uh, as, far, as far as I knew. Um, after watching the video, though, I remember him kind of like looking back yeah so maybe he was maybe he was or maybe he was like not wanting me to beat him (laughs) because i think he has i think he has a lot of pride in being you know very fast at that race i mean he would always win uh into calf on that race so who knows but all all i know is once i got i was separated from him for a little bit and then i was like i gotta catch up to him like i can't let him get away from me um I just knew that if I could stay with him close, then I would be pretty close. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was pretty, I was pretty close. <laughs> I think it was like a second or half a second and I would have uh, not broken the record. So, um, I just remember looking at his feet on the ground. I didn't even look up. I was like, I don't even want to know how far much further I have to go. I'm just going to watch this guy's legs. <laughs> so, yeah. You won in Rio the following year, your second Olympic gold. And, a few years ago, you wrote a letter to your younger self, and in the letter, you wrote, you wrote about the London Olympics, and you wrote, mm-hmm. so you're, you're talking to your younger self, you will compete at the London Olympics, but during your time at the Games, you will choose for the most part to stay in your room. People will ask you how love mm-hmm. was in the village, but you will have no clue. Is it something you did differently in Rio? Um, yes and no. In Rio, I spent a lot more time in the dining hall. Um, that's basically it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I spend a lot more time with um, teammates. Uh, I spend a lot more time with my wife. Um, and we, we actually did the Canadian training camp. And uh, I, I spent time, we just played games with all the other athletes. So I knew that that was going to be my last Olympics. Um, so I spent more time just kind of being in the environment, if that made sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't go out and like party or do any of that or go out into Rio uh, and party or do anything like that. But I think for me, it was more just you're part of this thing. Um, It's a very special thing. Not everybody gets to be a part of. 
and this is most likely your last experience doing so as an athlete. So um, that, I would say that's the only thing I changed. I didn't like sit in my room so much, but I would kind of, you know, walk around the village and just look at the buildings and like try to take it in if I could. Um, yeah. I wanted to talk about training for, for the decathlon because you obviously mm -hmm. can't train as much as for each event as specialists do. Sure. How did it go? Yeah, we broke the year down into uh, four phases and we would start the base training phase in October, November. So a couple months after a big competition um, or after like the Olympics or the Worlds. And that would last three months. And during that phase, we would do a lot of circuit weightlifting training, a lot of like longer, um, I would say harder-ish running. And then the next phase was um, our like technical phase. So we started getting spikes on and started doing more technique stuff, like actually jumping in the pole and actually jumping in the high jump and so on. In the base phase, it was just drills. And then the next phase uh, would start in the summer would be competition phase. Um, which, you know, you obviously travel competition, practice a little bit less, uh, just more intense. And then the final phase is rest, <laughs> um, which within each one of those phases, um, so every, we didn't do it by months, but basically we do two weeks hard, one week rest. Okay. So the two, the two hard weeks meant like basically normal. The rest week was we would come to practice for a shorter amount of time and we wouldn't do a ton of lifting we wouldn't do super hard running we would just kind of um yeah just rest but keep our body active and the purpose of this was because you cannot well we have experienced like we cannot sustain hard training all the time like we need to kind of build in ups and downs um within a week monday we would come to practice every day we would practice from basically 10 to 1 and on mondays Wednesdays and uh, Fridays, those would be our hard kind of running and jumping days. Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays would be our throwing and lifting days. And Monday would be like shot put, uh, high jump, um, hurdles, and then we do running. Wednesday would be pole vault, um, long jump, and some running. And Friday, we would kind of choose one of those events to, to do, or we do both, and then we do some more running. Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays was kind of old, or Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays was always the same. Discus, javelin, lifting. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, we do block starts in there and uh, stuff like that. So that's how we broke it down. Are some events surprisingly similar? Yeah, I mean, the body positions that one must um, have to produce power <laughs> are all generally pretty much the same. So the javelin body position, Um, if you like pause it right when they're about to throw is very similar to the discus uh, is very similar to like baseball. Um, you know, it's, it's just where your arm is mm -hmm. basically. Um, so if we did javelin and in high jump too, is very similar, kind of like this body posture up body back. Um, anyway, so I would say all the events have the same fundamental principles, um, the same fundamental body positions that would produce power and it took a long time to learn that and uh understand that but yeah did you train with uh specialists sometimes because i know kevin mayo does that we initially just trained with harry for several years and then as we started getting older our improvements started getting smaller and smaller but we still felt as if our potential was high in those things so we thought um you know we would talk with harry about a couple specific events, Brianna and I were different, but for me, the javelin, um, the high jump and the discus. So in, in those three events, we did work with specialists from time to time. Okay. And was there one, one particular event that you found more challenging? High jump. Always? High jump. Not always. In 2011, that was the last time I jumped good. Uh, maybe 2012, but 2011, I was consistently jumping like 209 to 211 type of thing. Um, and then 2012, I think probably that too. But something happened, I believe 2013, when I was just getting ready to go to 
uh, Gutsis was 2013. Gutsis. There were a couple times I tried to go to Gutsis and I just basically got hurt. Um, so that's super unfortunate. But um, yeah, there's there was one time I I went into the high jump. I arched over the bar, and my lower back. I don't know what happened. Still to this day, I don't know what happened to it. And I was just like, oh my God, I cannot even stand up. And ever since then, um, and then there was a time because of that lower back at practice. I remember the shortly after that where I hurt my knee. I was like compensating, whatever. Ever since then, I was just never able to continue to jump high or just didn't couldn't get my body in the right position. High jump always hurt after that. And I always jumped like crap. <laughs> I mean... I, I would jump like 192 in some meets. Um, like Katarina and Naki Tiam would jump higher than I did. Uh, so it was just, high jump was always a challenge. So would you say it's the one event where you didn't fulfill your full potential or was there another one? Yeah, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. I think I had the potential to jump, you know, seven feet or 213. Uh, I always had like a lot of good jumping capability. I always tell people I, I can jump high. I just can't high jump. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would say that's the most, that's the event where I probably left the most points on the table. Mm -hmm. Like when I look at my scores, it's like, oh, wow, you broke the world record and you jumped like 196 or 201. It's like, God, if I would have jumped 209, I think every bar is like seven points or something. It would have been super good uh, or much better anyway. That's actually another question I had because some throws don't give that that many points, right? It's not really, mm -hmm. is it something you had in mind in, in training? Like, did you ever feel like, oh, this is more, more worth training for this particular event because it might give me more, more points? Um, not in training necessarily. I think in training, what we try to do the most is continue to maintain a performance uh, minimum that would allow me to uh, be competitive and score high. Uh, high enough to like metal and that's what we focused on the most so it's like what do we just need to maintain and then what we do after that is where are the areas we could maximize point um improvement so a lot of the time it was the throws i mean that would be the thing where in a competition i would have a big lead after the long jump or after the 100 and the long jump and then all of a sudden the shot would come around and be like okay he threw you know 40 uh, you know, 14.1 meters. <laughs> um, if you could throw 14.8, that would be better. <laughs> so, you know, it's, we'd focus on that kind of stuff. But I learned probably my sophomore year of college that my abilities were better suited to scoring high in a decathlon, which was interesting because generally decathletes in the past have been big people and all around good, kind of like Kevin. But we had two examples in the US of athletes that came before me that were super good at running and jumping. Um, actually, Brian Clay was also good at throwing, but Brian and Trey were like very fast guys. And uh, then I came along and I was like fast and good at jumping, but I was super bad at throws. But you could you could see that, oh my gosh, you can still be competitive if you're like absolutely terrible at throws, but you can just run and jump super good. So after that, I was like, huh, I might be better suited for scoring well in this event. Mm -hmm. How many minutes is actually a decathlon? How many minutes competing over two days? Do you know that? Yeah. Um, a typical international decathlon at a major championship is 26 hours long. So you start at nine and you end at 1030, basically. Um, that's 26 hours on the field. <laughs> uh, if you start at nine, you wake up at 5 a.m. If you end at 1030, your 400 meters, uh, you get back to the village after physio and food, um, and you're in bed by 1230. Mm -hmm. So your day is like 19 hours long. Um, of those 19 hours, you spend about five minutes and I would say five and a half minutes. Well, no, maybe, sorry, sorry. Six and a half minutes competing. And, and four and a half of those are the 15. Yeah. That's crazy. So what do you do in your downtime to 
maybe not overthink or yeah so out of 26 hours um you only compete for six minutes what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the time uh I mean, warm up obviously but when there's nothing to yeah. do yeah i would say for majority of those 26 hours you are sitting around thinking about the previous event that might might not have gone as well as planned honestly anything um like you'll think about your events you'll think about what you need to do next you'll think about the points you'll think about the other competitors you'll chat with them um you look up into the stands you'll be like wow i can't believe i'm an athlete this is so cool <laughs> uh or you know some competitions you're like where is everybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yeah, honestly, for a majority of that time, you are like getting up, sitting down, getting up, sitting down, you know, you're pacing around, you're, you're in a stressful environment and any biological creature in a stressful environment naturally does things to try to uh, sh shed that stress. And it usually involves, you know, fidgeting, chatting, maybe trying to fall asleep a little bit, but you don't want to fall asleep too much because then you might wake up like all groggy, da da da. So yeah, it's a very interesting mind game, the decathlon. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's what I would do, you know, sit. And then after you get more comfortable, you're chatting with your with your uh, fellow competitors. Uh, and you're watching, honestly. That's another mm -hmm. thing I forgot. You're, you're watching other people perform and you're cheering them on. And you're, um, you know, you're saying, man, are they hurt? Are they, are they good? Uh, what could they be doing better? What can I learn from them? What is the weirdest instruction your coach ever gave you? The weirdest one? Yeah. Honestly, well... I would say it was weird at first and then it wasn't weird later. But one day Harry said, uh, we're going to start training in the pool. We were kind of older. Um, and I think he was you know, worried about us beating up our bodies long-term. And so we started doing running workouts in the pool and he like wrote this workout. Um, and I was like, I don't know if that's going to be hard. Uh, at at the University of Oregon, we had underwater treadmills, so we could turn up the speed very high and turn on the water jets to make it more difficult. But uh, initially, I was like, I don't see how this is going to be helpful, but okay. <laughs> um, so that that was really the only the only weird one. Uh, yeah. Okay, I want to respect your time, so I'm almost done. Can you tell yeah. us about the decision to retire and what what you've been up to since then and maybe what skills you learned as an athlete you've been able to use in your new life. Sure. How many years? Oh, what's today? January 5th. That is so funny because um, I guess six years ago on January 4th, Brianna and I announced our retirement <laughs> um, in 2017. And the year of 2017, all we did was visit friends and family and uh, kind of think about what we were going to do next and where we were going to move. Um, was that entire year was devoted to just like, hey, we're not athletes anymore. Let's rest and, and visit people that have supported us over the years. And then um, the, at the end of that year, we moved to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, what we did was work at startup companies. And for me personally, I just wanted to get involved in science and technology. The thing I wanted to do after sport is be involved in um, industries like sustainable energy or space that I thought were just exciting and important for the future. Um, but that's not what you started in college, right? No, in college, I studied psychology. Okay. So in college, I, I was always, always interested in, in science and technology, but I was very, I was the classic case of being afraid of math. Um, and I think that's just a product of not having very good teachers or coaches, if you will. Uh, that could show me beauty of it. But um, yeah, anyway, so that's what we did 2018, 2019. And then in 2019, Brian and I took a trip, a vacation to uh, Iceland and Amsterdam. Um, and that's when we found out we were going to have a kid. And that's also when I decided to stop working and go to school for mechanical engineering. And I'd been putting it off for a while. And I thought maybe I'm too old to go back to school and learn these things that I actually wanted to learn, the science and technology, but um, or science and engineering, rather. But I said, to hell with it. I don't care. I'm going to do it. And so um, that's what I started doing in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I've been... And then I also started working at Intel. Um, 
And so from 19 to 22, I basically worked at Intel, um, went to school part-time, and we had two kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, at Intel, my role was actually cool. Um, uh, the work that I got to do was very cool because it was for the Olympic Games and for track and field specifically. And long story short, we used computers, uh, our cameras, and computer vision and AI to track human motion. And then what we would do is output 3D biomechanic information. So if I threw discus or somebody did a ballet dance or went over a hurdle on film, we could recreate a 3D skeleton of that motion and give you velocities and angles of like every joint in your body. Um, and that work is continued. I have since left Intel. So the start of 2023, um, now I'm, I'm in school full-time. I have about a year left of mechanical engineering. Um, and the goal after this is to, you know, start a career in, uh, sustainable energy. Um, and then we'll see where, uh, where things go from there, but I'm still very interested in space. Um, and also very interested in education. The podcast is called Athletes, Athletes Mondiaux, so Athletes of the World, because what I love the most about track and field is the fact that it is a truly universal sport. Anybody can do track and field. Yeah. So what is the one thing yeah. you love the most about track and field? And as a decathlete, I guess. I mean, I guess you love love it all, but maybe not. <laughs> well, the thing I love about track and field isn't necessarily the uh, events. What I love about track is you could be standing next to the greatest distance runner of all time, and you would never know it. Um, you could you could be on an airplane with the world's best pole vaulter. Uh, and, and, you know, the best pole vaulter in history, and you would never know it. And the the diversity of body and background and mind that track and field um, provides opportunity for is not found in any other sport. Like if you lined up all of the athletes, it, you're just like, wow, this is an incredibly diverse set of folks. From Ryan Krauser in the shot put to... Um, you know, Michele in the distance, you're like, what is going on here? Mm. Um, and that's what I love about it. It's just, and the second thing I love about track and field um, is it, it does bring the world together. Yeah. Um, and then the final thing I love about track and field is the measurability. So the times, the distances, the heights, I think it's very rewarding as a, person to like if you are somebody who wants to improve you want a measurable result right. <laughs> yeah. and uh if, even if it's a 100th of a second or a fraction of a centimeter you're like yes i am better <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and so um those are the things those are the three things i love about track and field and is the decathlon the best way to know who's the best athlete in the world i i don't believe so i think The decathlon right now is what I'll call the best standardized test of athleticism that we have. My personal opinion is that if you wanted to find the best athlete in the world, um, you would need to set up a competition that tested the, the rate and range of someone's ability. So to test the rate, what you would need to do is present competitors with a set of totally new um, athletic movements or athletic goals. Like it can be shooting something or it can be like doing something with your body, clearing like a hurdle, like, you know, just something totally new though. And the reason it has to be novel is because you're testing how much body control and mind control they have to be able to pick up this new thing. Um, and what you need to do is set five, or more levels of this, these movements, like difficulty levels. And what you're going to do to test the rate and range is the person who basically fin does the most, the fastest is the best because you can have somebody who's like picks up a skill very quickly, but maybe they can't take it to level 10. They can like only take it to level two, or you have somebody that picks it up slowly, takes it to 10, or you have somebody in the middle that goes to like level seven, but they get there before everybody else. So to me, it's putting people into novel body movements um, with implements maybe even and testing the rate and range the person who has the best rate and range 
in a uh, novel athletic movement to me is the best athlete. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. Anything you want to leave us with? Any final words of wisdom? Wow, words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, may, maybe there's some nuggets of wisdom in there. I, it's hard to always kind of uh, leave off with, you know, a, a final thing for somebody to think about. But um, what I will say is I, you know, appreciate what you're doing. Um, kind of letting athletes continue to, to have their voice and stories out there. The older I get, the more, the more important I think stories are um, because I think they inspire people. Uh, and, this, and the second is, you know, all the fans and future uh, competitors and athletes and current competitors and athletes listening. You know, thanks for, thanks for the support. It was a pleasure to be and, and still in some way be part of uh, the track and field history. Yeah, you are definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matilda. And that's a wrap. I'd like to thank Ashton for his time and thank you all for listening. If you liked the episode, please share it on social media and make sure to subscribe to the podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast, please check the links in the description. That's it for today. I'll be back soon with another episode. Bye.